Good morning. For everyone expecting Pastor Quincy to speak today, I'm sorry. I'm not him. In fact, I'm not even a preacher. I feel more comfortable simply describing myself as a guest speaker, so we'll leave it at that. But I probably have better credentials than Quincy has. I am Mr. Sally Van Bocklin. <laughs> Does not get much better than that. <laughs> Last week, Mark Kilmer, who's a real preacher, filled in for Quincy. He pointed out that last Sunday was the third day of Christmas, and he had received three French hens, which he promptly ran down to Ed Harrison and had him start cooking them. Today is the tenth day of Christmas, and I received ten lords a leaping. They are currently in the back with the three French hens that are still cooking. The title of my talk today is The Body of Christ. The scripture is Matthew 2, 1 through 12. It's called The Visit of the Wise Men, or also called the Magi. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is a child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star in, the, in its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him was frightened. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. And so it, was, has been, so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means last among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them at the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard, when they had heard the king, they set out and were there ahead of them. Went the star that they had seen at the rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warmed in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. As the wise men were led to the Messiah by the bright star in the eastern skies, we are going to be led by God and Jesus on a tandem bike ride. Please follow along with me as I have Chris <laughs> read the poem entitled The Road of Life. At first I saw God as my observer, my judge keeping track of the things I did wrong, so as to know whether I merited heaven or hell when I die. He was out there sort of like a president. I recognized his picture when I saw it, but I really didn't know him. But later on when I met Christ, it seemed as though life was rather like a bike ride, but it was a tandem bike, and I noticed that Christ was in the back helping me pedal. I don't know just when it was that he suggested we change places, but life has not been the same since. When I had control, I knew the way. It was rather boring, but predictable. It was the shortest distance between two points. But when he took the lead, he knew these delightful long cuts, up mountains, up through rocky places at breakneck speeds. It was all I could do to hang on. Even though it looked like madness, he said, pedal. I worried and was anxious and asked, where are you taking me? He laughed and didn't answer. And I started to learn to trust. I forgot my boring life and entered into the adventure. And when I'd say, I'm scared, 
He just leaned back and touched my hand. He took me to people with gifts that I needed, gifts of healing, acceptance, and joy. And they gave me gifts to take on my journey, my Lord's and mine. And we were off again. He said, give gifts away. They're extra baggage, too much weight. So I did. To people we met, and I found that in giving, I received. And still our burden was light. I didn't trust him at first, you know, in control of my life. I thought he'd wreck it. But he knows bike secrets, knows how to make it bend to take sharp corners, knows how to jump to clear high rocks, knows how to fly to shorten scary passages. And I am learning to shut up and pedal in the strangest places. And I'm beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze on my face with my delightful, constant companion, Jesus Christ. And when I'm sure I just can't do any more, he just smiles and says, pedal. Thanks, Chris. I wish I had your first service. <laughs> Each of us are in this poem, so I ask you to get ready to pedal. Have you ever ridden a, ridden a tandem bike? I've ridden one exactly one time. And that does not by any objective standard make me much of an expert on the art of riding a tandem bike. However, it does give me the right to make some observations. First is that it's a little hard to balance the first time, particularly the start. Everybody, two of them get up at the same time trying to get on that bike. Both people need to be in harmony with each other, or you will promptly and unceremoniously fall over. I did that the first and only time I rode the tandem bike. Matter of fact, I did it a whole bunch of times. The second thing, which should have been obvious to me, was that the person in the front controls the direction that you go. If you are in the back seat, your sole responsibility is to pedal and not cause a wreck. Caused a few of those, too. Let me tell you a little more about my one and only time on a tandem bike. Many, many years ago, I had met and was dating this wonderful woman who would eventually become my wife. Never understood quite why. I married way above my station in life. But I digress. <laughs> anyway, Sally had invited me to the family cottage in Michigan. She invited me for just for the weekend, but I had so much fun she had trouble getting rid of me. I think her father said, is he ever going to leave? <laughs> and actually, she never did get rid of me. Sai and her sister, Burry, who had recently mar married, was there with her husband, Steve. And they thought we should visit some of the wild places where they used to hang out while they were growing up. They were known as the Stony Lake Babes. Of course, at least they thought they were. I was told that. <laughs> we drove to Silver Lake and rented two of the most old and rickety tandem bikes I had ever seen. Sally and Burry had also packed some picnic lunches and also packed some adult beverages. Everything was looking good for me as I prepared for a little romantic interlude. After some marginal attempts to get the bike up and going, also known as crashes, we finally got our rickety bikes up and going. Sally was on the front, I was on the back. Did I say the rider in the front is in control? That should have been an indicator that this may not end up all that well, notwithstanding my high expectations. We headed down a paved road and then turned off on a gr gravel road. I complained somewhat. Actually, I complained a whole lot. But remember, I was in the back. Sally was in control. Let me back up just a second. Sally's sister, Burry, had suggested that we go to the Silver Hills Club, which was on the gravel road. I figured that is where we were going for our picnic lunch, romantic interlude, and some adult beverages. Otherwise, by this time, I would have been screaming bloody murder. I was not enjoying my tandem bike ride, ride one iota. We ride the gates of the Silver Hills Club, and now for the first time, and much to my shock, I learned that the Silver Hills Club was a nudist colony. <laughs> and the sisters used to sneak in to watch the active game of nude volleyball. And that's what they intended to do this time likewise. Well, not Joe. I have some pride and some principles, even if my wife-to-be did not. 
Plus, I'm somewhat of a wussy when it comes to these types of adventurous things. Now, while this talk is about the body of Christ, rest assured that no one expected to see the body of Christ inside the Silver Hills nudist camp. I told them that I would bravely stay back with the bikes and guard, guard them. They left and apparently started to crawl under the fence when I heard this voice yelled out from a tree, hey, what are you doing? They took off and ran back toward the bikes. I was already on my tandem bike, solo, as fast as I could down the gravel road, throwing rocks up all over the place. As unstable a tandem bike is with two, let me tell you, it's even more so with one. All I heard were Burry and Steve yelling, run, Sally, run. So it reminded me of the scene from Forrest Gump. I remember when Forrest was uh, being chased by boys on bikes and his friend was yelling, run, Forrest, run. What happened out there, though, was a lack of trust. I did not trust Sally to take me to a safe place. I needed to be in control. The poem talks about trust and control and giving up control. It also talks about how wonderful the ride is when you turn it control over to God. But when he took the lead, he knew delightful lawn cuts, up mountains and through rocky places at breakneck speeds. The Magi were not distracted on their mission to find the Messiah by Herod. They continued to follow the star in the east. While we all have stars in the east to follow, we often become distracted as I did, and, they, and we try to chart our own ways while we're in control. As I think back, God has always been with me. However, the place I needed to go to better understand this was a place where I was a very infrequent visitor, and that was church. Church was simply not a big part of my priorities. Sally was a church person. She was my proxy, or so I thought. I then attended the great banquet, which I would recommend for anyone who wants a better understanding of their spirituality, or in my case, a lack of it. After the great banquet, which I can best describe for myself as a life-altering experience, I learned I needed to become part of the body of Christ, the community of the Christians, which is the church. This community taught me about relationships, the need to be in relationship with God, enlightenment through study, and the joy of Christian life. The church transformed me. It has never let me down at any time when I've had times of stress and fear. My best friends are members of the body of Christ, many are at Westminster Presbyterian. I learned to trust in God. I found God at Westminster. I learned that, in fact, I had been riding in tandem with him for many years. The great banquet helped me open my eyes to see and my ears to hear. However, as time went by, I again decided that I needed to be in control. So I changed places with God. He was now in the back seat. The scary thing about giving up control is that you have to place your trust in someone else. As the poem says, when I had control, I knew the way. It was rather boring, but predictable. It was the shortest distance between two points. However, I needed to remember the lessons of the great banquet that God needed to be in control. This is the lesson of the wise men as they followed that star. However, a change was going to happen whether I wanted it to or not. As the poem says, I don't know just when it was that he suggested we change places, but life has never been the same since. Telling personal faith stories has never been easy for me, and still isn't. <laughs> However, being a part of the body of Christ is trusting, so here goes. It was the middle of January 2001. I woke up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and on the verge of tears. I just decided I could not accept if offered what I considered to be my dream job. My priorities were inconsistent with my dream job. I was in front of the tandem bike trying to control the direction and the outcomes. I was asking God to pedal, but I would determine where we would go. I dreamed about someday becoming the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Indiana. The dream started when I was an assistant United States Attorney and stayed with me over 25 years that I was in private practice. And now I was on the cusp of being 
possibly recommended for that position. The interview was scheduled for February 22, 2001. But my priorities were not in tune with God's gentle voice. What was the problem? What were the priority issues? On reflection now, it seems pretty silly. But at the time, I thought of giving, of giving up a significant part of my income to take my dream job was simply too much for me. I wanted my toys. I wrote the head of the selection committee the next morning and asked that my name be withdrawn from consideration. It was over. I would continue in control on my predictable way, even if boring and predictable. It was safe. However, while I may have thought it, thought it was over without knowing, God had again changed places with me on the bike. He was now in control. So while I had forgotten God, he had not forgotten me. The committee chair, upon getting my letter, called me and asked whether I would consider still coming for the interview. And while I restated my position, that I would not accept the position even if offered, I think General Sherman had to run at that one, uh, I would come. But that general voice would come to me again, and would come to me through the body of Christ. My daily routine after the great banquet included reading the daily word, a devotional. I had not read, the day, read it the day of the interview because I couldn't find it. I think Sally had it. <laughs> While the interview had gone well, I was still firm in my position that as much as I wanted to be offered the position, I would not accept it. When I got back from the interview, a member of our church had a voice message for me. It was a daily word reading for that day. Let me share it with you, and hopefully I can see it. I make hundreds of decisions each day. Some seem of major significance, some are very simple. I understand, however, that that my life today has been influenced by all of the decisions I have, choices, decisions that I have made. So when I do come to a crossroad, how do I determine which path to take? I prepare myself for the moment. I quiet all fear and doubt, and I release any attachment I may have to a specific outcome. Then I listen for the gentle, God's gentle instructions. God speaks to me when I am silent and receptive to doing, so, doing my part in God's plan. I am willing to follow God's lead and to, and to do whatever I can to help bring about the highest good for everyone involved. Whatever my destination may turn out to be, I know that I am trying, I'm moving toward it on a path that, is God, that God prepared for me. Talk about a wow moment. No doubt now who was in the front seat. No doubt who was in control. From that point on, I understood what it meant to be a part of the body of Christ. It meant that when God opens doors, you need to open your eyes to see. It meant when God talked to me, I needed to open my ears to hear. And yes, for the curious, the position was offered, and I took it, and I have never looked back. What is important to me is, if Darlene Smith had not called me with the daily word reading that day, this opportunity may never avail itself to me. But this is not just my story. This is the story of the Magi, the wise men who followed the star. It is a story of everyone in this room, in this community, and I'd suggest even the world. It is what happens when you turn control of our lives over to God. It is when you listen to God's gentle voice. It's when the doors are open for you. You need to have the faith to walk through to the other side.
As much as, as much as others need you, you need others. Being Christ with skin on to others builds the, and maintains relationships binding in us together as individuals and as the church. There are times when all that we can do is to hang on. The important message is don't try to pedal alone. I've learned when I'm experiencing a particularly stressful time, I have lost contact with God. I'm in front trying to control where I'm going. It's during prayer that I sense him leaning back and patting my hand. I need spiritual support through prayer, especially when I have trouble pedaling. In an atmosphere of love, we should continue to be led to discover life's priorities. In an atmosphere of acceptance, we should always be free to ask, search, seek, and grow. In an atmosphere of boldness, we should consistently, we should constantly be challenged to go make disciples. The body of Christ is the church, the unique gathering of people who have received the grace of Jesus, believed in his name, and chosen to be his followers. I want to close with the last part of the road of life. And I am learning to shut up and pedal in the strangest places. I am beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze in my face with my delightful constant companion, Jesus Christ. And when I'm sure I just can't do it anymore, he just smiles and says, pedal. Amen. <laughs>